we bring change in our life? Now that's the good question that a lot of people ask and a lot of people don't even like to change. Well, we'll talk about that today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Him. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. Thank you for joining us as we go through the Bible in one year from Genesis to Revelation. Corey, what are you doing today? We're gonna to be taking a look at incense and its use in the Bible and the Bible's culture. Excellent, very good, look forward to that. Now, what did you do, Jan? Today I wanna to talk about our life in Christ Jesus. All right, very good, our life in the Lord. Look forward to that. And also Ryan is here, Ryan, what's up? Well, today is part of our science series. I'm searching for the biggest and baddest predator that ever lived on the planet. All right, the biggest and baddest predator that ever lived on the planet. I'm going to stay tuned. That, that's really good. All right, stay there as we get the Bible out and begin the study right now. Proverbs chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Proverbs chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. You know, many people believe that the only way a government changes is to vote out or remove the people in leadership. <laughs> but what if the first part of changing the government is not replacing the people, but bringing a change to the people who are in leadership? You see, everyone needs the Lord. Everybody does. Every political party needs a witness of Jesus Christ and his way of thinking. Every individual, every group, every nation needs a new transformed mind of Christ. When we want to change in the way things operate and run, we should pray that God changes us. Us changes me. And those who hold to leadership within the governments of man. See, God moves the same way across all institutions and all societies. People are changed when they come to Jesus Christ with their heart and their mind, their soul and their strength. Perhaps we need to reconsider the way God moves things in his direction. And we need to follow his lead instead of making our own lead. Very interesting. You know, it's important for us to recognize that, that God is trying to reach everybody. And there are some people who don't seem like they're going to be reached. And they seem like they're way out in left field. They're, you know, way, you know, I don't know, where are they at? They're, you know, down the line. We can't even see them. And you know, it's amazing because God is everywhere. Even way out in left field. Way out in right field. Way out in center field. And right here. God is everywhere. And God desires to save people. He doesn't desire people to be hurt. He doesn't desire people to be smacked down. He desires to save people, beloved. We must remember that. Now, with your Bible guide, go to today's passage. If you don't have a Bible guide, simply write to us and you can get a hold of one. Uh, use the phone number to call us or you can go to www. Bible Discovery TV. And, and when you go there, thank you so much for making a donation that would help us. We thank you for that. Pray about it. That's what God would have you do, and, and he'll do it. And uh, he'll encourage you to do whatever is necessary. Thank you. That keeps the lights on around here and, and the cameras rolling and the air condition on and things happening <laughs> so we can continue to work. But anyway, it's important for us to remember as we study this, how do we bring change? How do we bring change? Proverbs chapter 21, verses one to three. Now, as we look at this, we in Canada are going through an election in October, a federal election. And in the United States of America, they're going into a federal election next year. And everybody's sort of geared for the process. You know, everybody's looking at it, you know, who are we gonna get out, who are we gonna get in? We're doing this, we're doing that. You know, everybody's raising funds for this and they're, 
But as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to understand that everybody, every party, every person, every individual needs to know Jesus Christ, needs to understand who he is. So with that in mind, we pray, Father, I pray to you and I come today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Help me to understand and help me to realize what you're doing. Because, Father, as we read your word, we need to read from it, not into it, but from it. And help us, Lord, to hear you. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we said together, amen. Look, look at Proverbs 21. This really gets good now. It says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. It doesn't say a good king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. A bad king's heart is not. No, hold on a minute. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. God turns the king's heart. Isn't that something? That is fascinating because God can change people. He can change the government, the direction the government goes. And we're committed to policies and all that. But in my view, we should be committed to God first. We need to pray and ask the Lord, who do we vote for? How do we do it? I'm not going to tell you who to vote for because the Lord knows you. And the Lord will tell you who to vote for. Very important. The Lord is in charge of the government leaders. We should pray and work to replace our own ideas with the way God wants us to think. And that's how God wants us to think. He wants us to understand that everybody's a human being and there are people who make bad choices and make bad directions in their life, but we need to be sure that we pray for them and we need to pray that God would change their heart, beloved. Very important, especially right now and especially in a democracy, in a, in a place where we choose the government, we need to say, Lord, help us to make the right choice. Very important. Now, we go to chapter 21, verse 2, and this is very interesting. It says, every way of man is right in his own eye. This describes us today. We think we're right in our own eyes. We do. We don't know everything that the president hears. We don't know everything that the prime minister knows. We, we have to understand that this is not true, but every way man thinks is right in his own eyes. But you see, the Lord, what he does is the Lord weighs the hearts, the decisions, how they make decisions. That's what God does. God does that. You see, we may think our plans are good and right, but God knows the truth and sees what our heart is doing. We should trust in the Lord. So we need to understand that it is God who have puts our government in place. It is the Lord who does this. And if, if there's something that, uh, you know, we, somebody voted in and they're making wrong decisions or bad decisions, there's a reason for it. And God, you know, we're being punished by our own decisions or whatever, but ultimately it's us. But when we come to the Lord and give our lives to him, then he acts in mercy towards us and he helps us through that. Very important to, to know that and to understand. We, we must hear what God is saying. Now, let's go back to the scripture. This is the third verse of Proverbs. We've only gone three verses. Can you believe that? This is the third verse of Proverbs chapter 21. Look at this now. To do righteousness, that is rightness with God, and justice, that is justice with man. To do righteousness with God and justice with man is more acceptable to the Lord, then sacrifice. He's saying that's more acceptable to the Lord to do righteousness and justice. Very important. You see, righteousness and justice are important to the Lord. Our hearts must be changed by God. We should let him change us. You know, I, I can tell you that's not an easy thing to do. Because I, one thing I can promise you, I don't like change. I don't want change in my life. But hold on a minute. God said, I've come into your life and I'm the Lord of your life and there's some things that need to change. It's in my word and help me. I'll, I'll get my Holy Spirit to help you. And you need to change these things. 
and we need to slowly work. To be, thank God he's merciful. Can you imagine if God wasn't? I mean, God is so merciful. He changes us slowly. We don't always get it right the first time, the fourth time, the 800th time. But God knows we're trying. And God changes us, beloved. And as we get to heaven, we will be changed. We will know and we will understand what God was doing. And we say, thank you, Lord. We praise your name, Father, for the goodness that you are to us. I want to tell you something. The longer I live in this life with God as my Lord, and I'm reading his word daily, the more I understand that God is amazing. The Lord Jesus Christ will change us as we allow him to. We must hear him today in the name of Jesus Christ. If someone were to ask you what you thought was the biggest and baddest predator of all time, what animal comes to mind? Well, I'm sure you're thinking of a few. Well, in my own studies, I sought to answer this question and the results were totally fascinating. Let's watch the report. When most think of the biggest and baddest predator that ever lived, images of the mighty Tyrannosaurus Rex no doubt come to mind. However, this title may belong to another creature entirely, a creature of the sea. Discovered in the 1920s in Queensland, Australia, Chronosaurus, a marine reptile that is now almost certainly extinct, has been called the Terror of the Seas. A most fitting title since this particular pleosaur could grow to lengths of more than 30 feet and weigh between 8 and 10 tons. Chronosaurus also had a huge skull with powerful jaws that combined the biting power of killer whales and crocodiles. Its back teeth were designed to crush even the toughest of shells. Yet there is another marine reptile which could also be considered the biggest and baddest predator that ever lived. Originally discovered in Europe in 1873, Leopleurodon, like Chronosaurus, was also a pleosaur. While there are debates over just how massive Leopleurodon was, fairly complete skeletons of the creature indicate that it was approximately 30 to 40 feet long, with a weight of up to 10 tons. However, there are tantalizing hints from scraps of bone that suggest that Leopleurodon could have been much, much larger. However, as Dr. Carl Whelan points out, even at the most modest conservative estimates, Leopleurodon was a powerful colossus of a carnivore. Its enormous 10-foot mouth was packed with very sharp teeth, which were twice as long as those of T. rex it would have been capable of making a meal out of some of the larger sharks. Other marine reptiles, such as Mosasaurus, Shonosaurus, and Styxosaurus, though probably not as fast and terrible, were similar in size or even larger than Chronosaurus and Leopleurodon. In fact, Mosasaurus has been called the marine equivalent to Tyrannosaurus rex, only much bigger. Based on their bones, some of them appear to have been up to 50 feet in length. If this is accurate, then this would make Mosasaurus the largest predatory carnivore the world has ever known. Shonosaurus, a type of ichthyosaur, was also massive, reaching lengths of 50 feet or more and weights of up to 40 tons. Its skull alone was about 10 feet long. Styxosaurus, a name meaning Hell River Reptile, was a type of elasmosaur and could reach lengths of up to 40 feet and weigh up to 10 tons. A most interesting feature of this marine reptile is its long neck. Indeed, its neck comprised about half of its entire body length. Interesting to note is that all of these creatures were reptiles and not fish, which meant that they would have had to regularly come to the surface for air. It is notable then that there have been several reports and stories from sailors who have observed long and sinewy sea serpents. Perhaps then some of these creatures are still with us today. So, in case you missed it, the title of biggest and baddest predator probably belongs to either the Chronosaurus or the Leopleurodon. Suddenly, some of the stories we hear of large sea monsters, like the famous Loch Ness Monster, don't sound so crazy after all. 
Hoaxes aside, we know from the fossils that these incredible animals did exist. Perhaps some even still do. This wouldn't be the first time that an animal thought long dead by evolutionists showed up alive at their door. Also, just on a technical note, these marine reptiles are not considered dinosaurs. Strictly speaking, dinosaurs are land reptiles. Now, tomorrow we'll look at some more of these amazing monsters of the deep. Right now, it's time for Corey. Thanks, Ryan. Today I'm going to be focusing in on a cultural element from the, the biblical time period uh, that ancient Israel lived through, focusing in specifically on the Old Testament time period uh, from Moses afterwards. We're going to be looking at a cultural element. We're going to be looking at incense. Now, incense is used in the Bible, uh, you know, in symbolism as a symbol to communicate a deeper spiritual truth, but it's also used practically in uh, temple temple uh, worship and sacrifice. So let's dig right in and jump right into it. Incense in the Bible. Burning aromatic substances has always been a way for people to turn poor smelling air into a more pleasant atmosphere. Incense in particular was valued in the ancient world for its purification properties. It was seen to be a type of cleaner for the air, and there were several commonly used and prized spices for this. The Bible tells us that incense was burned at the funerals of Jerusalem's kings, signifying its importance in their culture. But likely the most well-remembered biblical use of incense was in the tabernacle and the Jerusalem temple. Incense was burned daily on the specially made altar of incense, and a liquid version was used to anoint and commission the temple furniture, articles, and priests. Interestingly, while the descriptions of the incense altar and the rituals are given, their significance is not explained, their religious reasons not given. The careful reader of the Bible, however, will notice at least two later references to the symbolic meaning of incense. The first in the book of Psalms says, Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. The second reference is like it and comes from the New Testament book of Revelation, where in chapter 5, the prayers of God's people are said to be the smoke of incense rising to God. And in chapter 8, the prayers of God's people are offered with the incense. This meaning is especially interesting when paired with the instructions for the Day of Atonement. Once a year, the high priest was to go into the Holy of Holies but not without the protection of the incense. The smoke created by burning the temple's incense acted as protection for the priest, and God was said to actually appear in this smoke above the mercy seat. Prayer as a protection and as a vessel of revealing God. This incense offered in the Holy of Holies was not offered on the altar. Instead, hot coals were carried in on an incense shovel, and then ground incense was placed on top to create the sweet-smelling smoke. Archaeologically, there have been many incense shovels discovered, and none can claim direct heritage from the temple, but many from contemporary shrines and later synagogues make it very likely that they looked very much the same. So I hope that this puts a new spin on things when you read in the Bible about incense and sweet smelling things. Now, as we move forward in the scripture, we're going to get to books like Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, which talk about incense a lot. But then even when you get into the book of Revelation, there's incense being used as a symbol in there. So all over the Bible, whether it's in the law, whether it's in the middle here in these in, in wisdom literature, or whether it's in the prophets in Revelation at the very end, you do have this cultural element of incense. So uh, I hope it this gives you a little bit of a new level of understanding when you come across reading that it's not just like today's incense their incense sticks that you can buy in the store not quite the same thing has a uh, much more of a cultural connotation to it now we are going to be continuing to look at some sweet smelling things perfumes and and oils and things of that nature as we move forward through the wisdom literature so on the next couple of weeks on bible discovery uh keep an eye out for that i'll, I'll <laughs> tell you i mean i just a brief story when I was overseas uh, in, in Israel and we went up on this side of this mountain and I s noticed this place and 
uh, I didn't notice the little signs with lightning rods on it and all that stuff. So I didn't put together, it was said something in Hebrew. That's and I, not great. I, <laughs> the, the, the lightning sign is never a good sign. Well, I figured, you, you know, okay, to lightning, whatever. Pay it's, you know, to. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, we went up there and we looked inside, uh, and it was an old place. I was looking for maybe skeletons or something there, you know? <laughs> uh, but anyway, it was a, it was a, a place where um, it was made for Solomon had it made for perfume. Okay. And it was an incense factory. We weren't supposed to be there, by the way. And, I figured uh, from the lightning, the lightning signs. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, figured. there was a oh, minefield. Yes. But mm -hmm. anyway, oh. um, yeah, it was, it, it, it's another story. Anyway, we'll let you know on the, the Talk To Me podcast. Anyway, um, the idea was that I learned the, the maneuvering of incense was a big deal. Yep. That was a major industry. You know, humans like smelly things, good smelling things, <laughs> good smelling things. Good smelling things. <laughs> good smelling things. And, and it's it's very practical to have good smelling mm -hmm. things. But then also there's there's a, a very deeply rooted religious element in it that we read about, you know, in in uh, the Bible in terms of temple sacrifices and things like that. So, well, I, you know, I mean, everything's rooted in religion. And uh, because we are human beings and our, we're, we're we have spiritual. Beliefs. That's right and spiritual things are at the center of our soul. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. But I look forward to the uh, perfume. <laughs> that's gonna be fascinating. So anyway. It will be, it's a good study. What did you do? Took a look at, of course, we're in Proverbs chapter 21 today. You taught from there. I looked at verse 16. I thought it was really interesting. So I wanted to just expound on it a little bit more. 21, 16 says, a man who wanders. Now, remember, when we're talking about a man, it's not, we're not just talking about men. We're talking about mankind. We're talking about men and women. So a man who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. That's a pretty significant statement. Let me read it again. A man or a person who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. I want to go back and read the beginning of Proverbs to figure out where understanding comes from. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, this is how we establish our knowledge and our understanding. We, we need to love the Lord our God. You've heard me say it in the last few days. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. We need to seek him first and his righteousness. And I, I fear in this day and age, and it's not just in this day and age, but there's a slow fade sometimes that seems to happen yeah. in our lives. It's, it's not something that we set out to do, but sometimes uh, the busyness, uh, the stresses of this world can lead us away from this way of understanding, this relationship, this time that we need to set aside for God in our lives every day. And um, I, I, I really want to stress that today. There, there are those out there that feel stressed, that feel, Janice, don't add one more burden. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a relationship with a God who loves you, where, you know, if you're awake in the middle of the night, just begin to talk to him. Talk to God. That's what prayer is. Prayer is not a set of fancy words um, that you put together and that have to be a big, long sentence that even makes sense. It's just talking. It's talking to God. And, and, I, and it's very, very important. Um, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, again, something else that I'm going to be pounding over the next few days. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God. Acknowledge Him. He is God. He is the creator of the universe. He created you uniquely. He designed you for a purpose and a reason. He will direct your paths. He has created you for a purpose. And you just need to talk to him. And he can show you what those paths are. Don't let the slow fade happen in your life. Seek after God because he is your life. He is my life. He's the source 
Psalm 119, verse 105 says, Your word, talking about God, talking about this, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's what we don't want to wander away from because the scripture says a man who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. Why? Because when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, he gives you new life. It's in you. It's already there. We're laying dormant. It's kind of like that season of winter and we see that the trees don't have leaves anymore. The plants that come up every year, the annual, we don't see them, but they're not dead. They're just laying dormant. That's how we are without Jesus Christ. When we invite him to be a part of our life, to come in and dwell in us, when we give our lives over to him, he rejuvenates and wakes up that part that's just laying dormant. And that's a, it literally is a rebirth. You begin to think differently. You begin through Jesus Christ to, to become that new person. It doesn't happen all at once. There is that miracle moment when Jesus fills you and that burden gets lifted, but then he directs you, he leads you. And that's, it's just so wonderful to have. Don't let the slow fade happen. Start today and move forward with Jesus Christ. The ESV version of the Bible, uh, Proverbs 21, 16, what you just read, reads this way. One who wanders from the way of good sense wanders from the way of good sense, listen, will rest in the assembly of the dead. The assembly of the dead. That is stunning and that's amazing. When we go to a cemetery and we see people who are dead, that's the assembly of the dead. That's why God tells us that we are, if we have Jesus Christ in our life, that we're not in the cemetery, we're not in the grave, we're not in the ground, our spirit is with Jesus Christ. And that's what we recognize. And that's why we come to the Lord because he gives us eternal life.